five, if you will, with me this morning. We're going to bring to a kind of conclusion our study that we've spent the last, and I didn't believe this until I counted again, 14 weeks. And if you think that's long, you should see what, what the rest of it I haven't given you uh, would have taken us to. But um, as in everything, when you teach, you teach a subject out, eventually people kind of go, this again, really? And, you know, it's like, well, I'm excited about it. You should too. Really? So we're going to move on. Uh, next weekend is Thanksgiving weekend. We'll talk about the issue of Thanksgiving and stuff for a couple weeks. And then December's coming, so we'll talk about some of the Christmas story and everything and, and so forth. And just kind of end the year on a little uh, softer tone than what we've been studying, which has been about the real you and your makeup. And, and, how, and this morning, the title is How to Help Others, because that's really kind of where we've been headed and we've been building, and, and again, we've spent 14 weeks. The last five weeks, four, four or five weeks, we've been talking about depression and mental illness. And this, and they, really the issue on how to help others is in those two areas. But really, when I, we talk this morning, it's going to be about in any area. Because the Word of God is not bound by a subject matter. It actually impacts everything in our lives. Whether it's depression or mental illness or a happy day or a beautiful cloud, a cloudy day in Arizona, so we're not in 90, you know. I couldn't believe last week, 90 degrees. I'm like, really? It's October. Come on, you know. And then I watched some football yesterday afternoon after we got, and it's snowing, and I'm like, Dad, they deserve it, though, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we come out, you know, People, I go back to Chicago in April, and they ask at the men's meeting for GSB, and they ask, so how, how do you take that 115? I said, well, how do you handle 40 below? You know, it's all relative to how you live and where you're at. And uh, I take 115 air conditioning to air conditioning. <laughs> it's how I do it. By the way, I meant to mention a minute ago, we have folks from New York City here this morning. We have folks from Ohio. We have, yeah, <laughs> I knew if I said that, I'd get that reaction. Okay. And uh, I, we've got folks on, on the Internet from all over the country, and it's good to have folks here. First Thessalonians 5, if you will, verse number 18. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And, and again, we've been looking at the real you. We've been looking at really how, you, and, and the reason I did this was so that you could understand how God designed you to function and to operate. And how he has given you a spirit, soul, and a body, those three components, and how they're to interact with each other, and how, they're, how God made them so that when you would take in information, and I'm going to say it generically like that, even though I know we're in a room full of believers, because we take in information, don't we? How then that information has been designed to work down through our inner man, the spirit and the soul, and then work out and in, through into life in our body. And we looked at that, and, and we saw how God, when he, when he created man, He created man to be able to take in information, think about it, in, in their soul, take it in, in, in their spirit, and, and have that communion with God in their spirit, take in the Word of God, have it build up in that spirit, in that inner man, in your thinking process, then have your soul with the heart man believes under righteousness, the heart, the mentality of your inner man, reach over and say, that's what I'm going to do, that's what I'm going to obey, bring that over into your will, and then, and then have your conscience and your emotions get involved, and your emotions say, yep, look, let's go do that, how many of you this, rolled, this morning rolled over and said, do I have to come? Do I got to go to church today? Because it was cloudy, and it was nice and snuggly up underneath the covers, and your emotions said what? Oh, just stay. Five more minutes. Please, just five. But your will said, no, get up. And you get up. I got up this morning, hit the floor, and it's cold. I'm like, oh, man, it's cold. You know, your emotions get involved and they get things moving. Your conscience looks at that movement, that activity, and says, yep, that lines up with what we decided to do. Nope, that doesn't stop that. Let's do that and back and forth. And we looked at all of that. We, and we looked down at each of those components specifically. And then we moved over into the area of depression and mental illness because that is something that you and I need to recognize. We need to have on our, in our thinking. We need to identify it. We need to know how to handle it. We need, so we talked last week how to take care of yourself. 
1 Thessalonians 5.18 is how you take care of yourself. In everything. Notice it's not for everything. It's in everything. We're to do what? We're to give thanks. We, we have a choice to make. We can follow the, 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 the flesh and, and the lust of the flesh and the works of the flesh, or we can choose to follow the Spirit and the Word of God and have a productive life in Christ. And when life comes up, and I showed you some of those Bible characters. Noah, not Noah. We didn't look at Noah, did we? Noah was a good guy. Jonah, Elijah, Moses. You go look at Jeremiah. Go look at Caleb. Boy, we're not going to look at him, but Caleb. Here, you know who Caleb is? One of the two, okay, one of the two spies that come back and say, let's go. He's 40-something years old when that happens. Moses comes out and says, well, we can't go in. God said we can't go in, so now we've got to wander the wilderness for another 40 years. And then going in will be Joseph and uh, Caleb. Not Joseph. Joshua. See, I looked at you, and you got to, don't look at me. <laughs> Just don't look. Because I, I think of, I, I struggle with Joseph and Joshua, okay? Joshua, they come in. 45 years later, you know what Caleb says? He looked... You figure, 85 years old. And he looks at Jos jo see, Joshua. <laughs> and he says, Joshua. Now, they've been in the land rooting out the enemy. They've been in there winning the battles and going at it. They go in 40 years. They cross over. The ark goes in. They go in five years. They've been at war. Six years, they've been at war. They've chased the giants up into the mountains. And you know what? There stands that 85-year-old dude. And you know what he says? Let me at them. In my mind, in his thinking, what could he do? He'd go win the battle. But his body's how old? 85. It's like, come on, Caleb, really? And he's like, yes, Joshua, Moses promised me an inheritance in the land, and that's where it is, and I'm going to go get him. Boy, you're talking about a positive attitude. Proper thinking. So in life, when life comes up, what's the proper thinking process. And that's really what the last 14 weeks have, have been about, is for you and I to have the proper thinking process is about the details of life. Because when they come up, it gets usually ugly. It gets usually tough. It gets good. you got good moments. But man, you, you know, if you're married, you know, one minute your spouse is good, the next minute the spouse ain't so good. One minute this, the kids are this, the kids are that. You lose a job. You got all these things begin to happen in life. How do you respond to that? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells you how to do that. We're to do what? We're to give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know, everybody wants to do the will of God. Well, there's the will of God. Why aren't you doing that? Well, you know what? I know he wants me to use me over here doing this great thing. He don't want that. He wants this. Let's do that verse. So when it comes up to helping others, because that's what I want to spend the morning looking at, I said it last week as we begin, you've got to have yourself squared away before you really truly can step in and help others. Because others need you to be where you need to be. They need you to be there. So when you begin to think about helping others, and you begin to think about how in the world can I help others, because by the way, when you try to help family and friends, it, whether it's depression or mental illness or anything, just bring in the anything, usually what do they do to you? They usually push you away, don't they? They usually say, no, I'm okay, everything's good. So how do you handle that? How do you get, you know, Get in there to help. So here, here's just some, you got to have, uh, Dad said it one time many years ago, and, and I was sitting where you are and listening, and he said you always got to have a plan. When you have a plan, you know what that means you've done? You have sat down and thought about it. So you need to have that. So I begin to kind of do that from time to time over my ministry life, and when it comes to trying to help people, and you have to walk in love with them, and you got to come and deal with them, there, there's some kind of a guidelines or plan that I've come up with I just want to share with you. 
and maybe help you to be able to then be in the proper mindset to help others. The first issue is you just need to be there, physically there. No matter how much they try to push you away, you need to be physically there. You don't need to preach at them. You just need to be there. You don't need to condemn them. You don't need to try to fix it. You just need to be there. And by the way, your physical presence there in some of these other things of encouragement and the spirit of thanksgiving and so forth, your physical presence there, you know what it does to their whatever they're going through? It rebukes that. Because what do they see in you? You are where you need to be. And you're there. That's a big one. Just be there. The second big one, if there's a big, big A and a big B, is you don't sympathize with them. Don't justify their self-pity. Don't say to them, yep, you were right, you are wrong. You were wrong. Because what does that do to them? It emboldens them, doesn't it? Makes them feel better, doesn't it? Well, isn't that what we're trying to do? But that's not helping them. That's just keeping them where they are. Our goal is to help them come out. The, the verse in 2 Timothy 2, he says that they have to restore themselves. Them that oppose themselves are often bad doctrine. Well, the restoration there, if you come in and say, yeah, you know what, you were really right. Rick was a real jerk and you know he shouldn't have done that to you. All you did is did what? You validified, you justified their position, didn't you? And their position isn't one out of trying to, in everything, give thanks. It's one out of, I'm right and he's wrong. Selfishness. Do you follow that? That leads to the third one, which is to promote hope into their thinking. To come along and to shine a little light into their bad thinking. Because that's, again, how do you think about stuff? How do you respond to stuff? Be encouraging. That's the fourth issue. Don't, don't argue with them. Be gentle with them. Come along and, and encourage them and try to get them to come and to understand that they need to get, you, you need to get them thinking on something other than themselves. See? You're trying to break a cycle. When we had the the, the, the flow chart up on the board there. I told you, if you're going along and everything seems okay, and then all of a sudden you kind of run into a stumbling block and you begin to look back at the flow of your thinking process, you know, what do you do to fix it? You just reverse the flow and you say, hey, instead of working from my body, and I'm now going to work from my spirit the other direction. And you learn from it. So, so you need to come along and give them something to think about other than themselves. Which requires them, which requires you to encourage them to some activity. Help them, move them, help them to gradually get some responsibility back into their life. If, do you follow what's going on? By the way, this takes time, it takes investment, it takes energy. Don't be a cheerleader. Look over at Proverbs 25. What do you mean, don't be a cheerleader? Don't you want them to get feeling better? Well, yeah, duh. But you know what does a cheerleader do? You know, just sitting over on the sideline trying to cheer them on. You know, a heavy heart, a broken heart doesn't need that. A broken heart needs you to come along and just be there. Proverbs 25, if you look at verse number 20. As he that taketh away a garment in the cold weather, and as vinegar upon nitra, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. Proverbs 25.20, 20. I'm sorry if I said it wrong. 25.20. 25.20. 20. As he that taketh away a garment in the cold, you're out there and what do you do? You snatch it away. Hey, you know what that heavy heart doesn't need you to do that. It doesn't need you to come in and sing a merry song and, and everything. It just simply needs you to be sensitive to where they're at. To identify that, hey, I need to come up and, and, and I need to be there for whoever, whatever reason. And I need to be sensitive to what's going on. 
And I need to understand that it's not about me, it's about them. It's about helping them. It's about restoring them. It's about focusing on getting them out of that dark thinking that they're in. Come back with me to 2 Timothy 3. It's an interesting thing when you talk about helping people, they think that you need to just come up and hug them and love on them. And for some you do. But the motivation behind it has to be one of not of you, but of who you are in Christ. It's not I, but Christ that liveth in the life that I now live in the flesh. It's not I, it's Christ. I'm the, I'm the vehicle that's going to come up now and support and help, but I'm doing it out of a motivation of some understanding, of some sound doctrine. People always accuse me, believe it or not, <laughs> of no emotion. You don't teach, you don't have... You know where emotions come from? We did it on the board. Emotions come down the road. It isn't that you're emotionless. It's that you've got your emotions in check and you put them where they belong in the, in the cycle of understanding and in the cycle of thinking. And when you come up and you say, hey, I, I understand what's going on and I'm here for you. And I need to get your, you need to get back over here and think about who you are in Christ. Look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Verses we know. Verses you can all quote to me. All scriptures given by inspiration and is prof, by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We can say that we quote it, we know that verse, we love that verse. But think about this verse in helping others. Because what you have to do with people that you're trying to help is you need to get them back into the Word of God. Think about when we talked about depression and the mental illness and the psychology and, and, the, and the psychotherapy and all that stuff. And it's good stuff. you, you got to do for you. You make your decisions for yourself. I'll be honest with you. I just ask you that when you do that, make sure that you have who you are in Christ on the table too. Because one day you're going to die and that old body is going to be laid to grave and you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and you're going to stand before God the Father, God, or God the Son, okay? And you're going to have to give an account. And if you can say, I was here more than I was over here, that's a good thing that you're building onto your inner man, okay? I would never tell you don't get the help you need. I would never tell you don't take, do this, do that. But when you do, you need to also keep what in mind? Who you are in Christ. You have to. You're a saint of the Most High God that lives in a sin-cursed body. That's the deal. Period. You can psychoanalyze that puppy all day long. You know what it ends up coming back to? You're the saint of, a most high, of the Most High God in a sin-cursed body. Don't forget that. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, you need to get them back into the book. You need to stay in the book, by the way, because they're gonna, we're going to talk here in a minute. They need you to be where you are. And they need you to be where they need you to be. <laughs> look at verse, look at, look at doctrine. Don't we love the doctrine? Folks, you need to understand the doctrine. You need to understand you. Per, you're going to try and help me, okay? You to me, all right? You're going to come and try to help me because I'm doing what I'm not supposed to be doing. I'm thinking improperly. You need to understand what? The doctrine. You need to understand the nature of our flesh. You need to understand how God has designed you to function. You need to understand what the cross work has accomplished. Your identity in Christ. Your complete, total acceptance is in Him. Your complete and total forgiveness is in Him. See, when you understand that, you need to have the real truth in your thinking. And when you do that and you come to me, then you know what? You're being where I need you to be. You make, does that make sense? You're looking at me like, oh. It's not a pun. I got puns for later, okay? All right? No, you, you need the doctrine. You need to have, a, have, a, have, your, have your senses. Uh, that thing over in Hebrews 5. Hold on. Look, look over at Hebrews 5. It's a wonderful thing here. In Hebrews 5, verse 13 and 14. Folks, 
Hold on to Timothy, though, and we'll go right back to it. The doctrine you need to have for, look at Hebrews 5.13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. What is a baby in Christ? Someone who is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Do you see that? But the strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of, what's that word? Use. Have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. How do you mature up? How do you grow up? You use the word of God, don't you? And what does it do? It gives you the ability, the knowledge, come back to Timothy now, the ability to look and to discern, hey, this is what Rick needs. <laughs> and let's go give it to him. You need to understand the doctrine. You need to get into the Word of God rightly divided and study this stuff. Find out your identity. Learn your... Folks, that's why we talk about the grace life all the time. And that's why it's so, so critical because there is also the next thing, and that's reproof. Reproof here. You, you, you need to get down to the real source of the problem, the real root. And I'll be honest with you, usually the real root of the problems that you have and I have and we struggle with each other with is the issue of unbelief. That's usually really the real root. Because if you really understood who, if you really believed who you were in Christ, you wouldn't take some of the mind trips that you take. Well, you don't understand. I, I'm, I'm, there's, I understand that. But what does reproof do? Reproof comes in and, and says, look, you understand the doctrine, but you're sure not acting like the doctrine. Reproof is bad behavior. And when you trust in your own sufficiency rather than in the sufficiency you have in Christ, that comes out of unbelief. That's really, but again, this is you. You're trying to help me. You make sure you have your ducks in a row, if you will. Then you come to the issue of correction. That's an interesting one. It's a simple one. What do you do instead of what you're doing? <laughs> you, 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 you get that... You, you, you got your attention in the wrong place. Let's get you back over here where you belong. Folks, getting into the Word, you taking the truth of God's Word and applying it to the circumstances of life, that's where you're going to help people. That's where, when in our illustration, you come to me and you say, hey, let's get over here. Remember last week I told you, Paul says, examine yourselves. You examine yourself out. Then in Galatians 6, he talks there about if you're spiritual, restore such a one that's been overtaken in the fault. He's not talking about you know more verses than me. He's talking about someone spiritual who's got, their, who's got all this going on. They're coming, and what are they bringing? They're not bringing opinions and attitudes. They're bringing the Word of God rightly divided, and they're saying, look, here's where you need to be. You need to come back with that, and then you need to pray with them. And you need to pray with them with a thankful spirit. In everything, give thanks. Prayer, that, that wonderful asset that we've gotten from God that we have that allows us to commune with the Father about the daily details of life and how to take His Word then and apply it to the details of life. If you join us in our first hour, we're in 1 Timothy 2, and he lists four issues of prayer, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and givings of thanks for all men, for kings and all them that are in authority. Those four areas of prayer... Supplication, supply. I need that supply to be there for me, Lord. Hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help Rick, and this is what's going on with him. How do I help him? What's the verses? Where is the stuff at? Get in, and you know what the Lord says to you? you go study. <laughs> you know. So you get in, and you begin to study, and you begin to look at, it, and you go, Oh wow, look at that! I can do that. And then you go, Okay, Lord, we're going to go over here, and I'm going to, I'm praying that, you know, thank you, Lord, for who we are and what you've done for us, and I'm trying to help Rick. You know what you just did? You did supplications, intercessions, prayer, all, and, and thanksgiving all in one shot. <laughs> you just did them all. Intercessions is praying for other people. And what do you pray for? You pray to bring the details of the sound doctrine that you've learned. All sufficiency. All spiritual blessings. Bring all that thinking 
an understanding of His wisdom and knowledge into your daily life. And you begin to focus on a verse like Philippians 4.8. Whatsoever things are true and honest and just, what? Think on these things. And you begin to program your thinking. And the next thing you know, you're looking at Rick going, hey dude, come here, sit down here and let's talk. And then you, the tenth issue is you begin to spend time with them. And this is where the energy comes in, and this is where the effort comes in. And this is, here is where they need you to be where they need you to be. That's, this is where they, come over to Ephesians 5. Just notice this here in Ephesians 5. They need you to be who they need you to be, and, they, and you need to be in that condition all the time. I'll be honest with you. You need to be consistent in living in the grace life. I know we like to take Monday to Saturday off. We're just going to live in the grace life on Sunday because we're at church and Rick's going to remind us. But your Christian life is 24-7, 380 days a year. Okay, uh, i got some of you. At least I didn't say 24-8, you know. <laughs> okay. See, your folks, your Christian life, and you need to be who you are all the time because you don't know who's going to need you. And when they need you, you need to be where they need you to be. And you know where they need you to be? They need you to be in Ephesians 5 verse 1 here and 2 and following. They need you to be living in who you are in Christ consistently. Look at 5.1, Ephesians 5.1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Well, if you're going to follow God, who are you going to follow? you got to follow Paul, don't you? Didn't he already tell you that? Follow me as I follow Christ. So what are you going to be doing? Where are you at? You're already rightly dividing the word of truth, don't, aren't you? They need you to be doing what? Coming to the book dispensationally and accurately and correctly. Not pulling stuff out of thin air out of the Gospels. Trying to make Not over there in James 5 where you got the elders are circling the, the bed and you're laying out oil and you're laying on hands and the guy that's sick and so forth. Not doing any of that stuff that doesn't belong to the body of Christ. So where are you supposed to be? Instantly. Look at that. Where, where do I need you to be if you're going to help me? I need you to be in the right part of the book. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a, save, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. I need, we need to be walking in the love of God. You see that? The love of Christ. Now, isn't that interesting? First of all, we need to be following God and, and what his word to us today is to the body of Christ. And then we need to come over here and we need to walk in love. To walk in the love... By the way, the walk in love here is not go out and love other people first. I know everybody runs, people like to run over to Romans 13 and see you got to love your neighbor. That's not what walking in love is. The first place that you need to walk in love to is with yourself. You first need to understand how God has loved you. How has He loved you? He loved you so much that He did what? He sent His own Son to Calvary for you. It's a little different way of saying that, isn't it? But you need to think about that. Too many times, hold on to Ephesians. Ah, just go to 2 Corinthians 5. Too many times we like to put the cart before the horse, and we get out there trying to help other people, and you know what we don't understand completely? How he, what He's done for us. Folks, it's first for you to come to an understanding of how much God has loved you. And you know what? When we walk in God's love to us, to you, then 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 take on a whole different thinking for you. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again." Think about that from just read you in that verse. The love of Christ constrains you. He, the motivating factor is the love of Christ for you in your life. Why? Well, because that's what the preacher says on Sunday. No, because we think a certain way. We judge. We have discernment. We think about His love for us. 
What did he do for me? He died for me. But God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We understand who we are in Christ. We understand we're there because of his cross work. That's where we see his love for us. Not over in some mushy-gushy, huggy, emotional-based thing. By the way, that does come later. Not knocking it. Just don't put it over here. Put it where it belongs. He loves us. We understand that we are unconditionally accepted in the beloved. Unconditionally loved. Unconditionally forgiven. And when we understand that, flip over at Romans 5, thinking about this this way. Romans 5, when we understand that, then you know what we can do for others? We can go help them. And we can go love them. And our love will be motivated out of an understanding of the love of Christ for, uh, for me, for us, for you personally. Then you can run over and then you can put your arms around them and love on them, and hug them, and say, look, man, we got to get you back in the Word. How about coming to church with, get out of the house. Oh, my goodness. Get out of the bedroom. Get out of bed. Open the window. It stinks in here. Get up. Do something. But you can't go do that if you're over here not even sure about yourself. So if you're going to help others, what do you got to do? You got to get yourself in order. Now you can go over here and you can love on them. Look, look at Romans 5 and just kind of remember where you were. Verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. How you doing in that verse? Think about you. You're without strength. You're pretty weak, aren't you? You're so weak, you're ungodly. But yet what did he do? He committed his love toward us, and not while we were yet sinners, what happened? He died for us. Look at verse 7, or verse 8. Well, for scarcely for, verse 7, righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God committeth his love toward us, and not while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were, what condition were you in back there? Enemies. Now, you're going to go help somebody. What is their condition? How about without strength? They're not thinking right. They're in a low point. They're in the throes of depression. They're down in the dumps. They're wherever they're at. And what... So when you come to them, how are you coming to them? Hopefully in the same mind as he came to you. But you can only get there unless you what? Understand what he's done for you. Is any of this making any sense? It's clear as mud in my brain, so. Okay? You see, folks, in order to help people, It's going to come from an intelligent understanding of the Word of God rightly divided to you and the grace life working and living out and through you. And when you understand His love for you, then you can go out and love others. Then you can walk in love towards others. So in order for you to be where you need to be for others, you've got to have the proper thinking process. You've got to have the proper mindset. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. You know the verse, verse 7. You've got to already be there. If I come to you and I say, I need your help, I'm I'm expecting you to already be on board. To come up, be able to come up and say, here, been there, done that. I can give you the comfort in the scriptures and already been through that. Look at 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a... Oh, isn't that a good thing? Sound mind. Sound thinking in your life. 
Why? Because we understand how God's designed us to operate. We understand the connection between us and Him through the Word of God. We understand the goal of the sound doctrine. We understand that the, that the Scripture is there to make the man of God perfect and mature and able to work and to function properly. We got that. We understand it. We're doing it. We're living it. And yeah, we have a little bump here and there, but you know what? For the most part, we're on board. We're working from a frame of reference of a Colossians 2.10, we're complete in Christ. We're complete in Him who's the head of all principality and power. We're complete in the one, verse 9 says, that is the Godhead bodily. You think about that. The fullness of the Godhead lives in you. And that's where we're complete. We're complete in Ephesians 1, verse 3, in all the spiritual blessings. We ain't missing nothing. We've got it all. Look at how much He loved us. In Romans 8, He says that He freely gave us all things. Look at how much He loved you. What a provision. And we're to live out of who we are in Christ, and, and we're to live out of His love. And folks, we need to understand that. If we're going to help other people and be there for fathers and listen to them and, and help them get through whatever they're going through, and that's one of our jobs, by the way. Romans 12 is clear about that. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. You know what that means? That means we're involved with each other. Okay? That takes time, it takes energy, and it takes effort. I'm willing. Are you? See? Linda and I were talking the other day. It's like somewhere along the line, the, the conception or the perception that I'm not interested in helping you guys came out. And I'm not quite sure how that did, except maybe a couple of things that I said taken the wrong way. And that's completely the wrong. My door is always open. My phone's always going to go to voicemail probably. But it, I'll, I'll get to you, okay? One of the, it's interesting on Facebook, one of the things when they rate companies is how quick do they respond to an inquiry. You know, hey, we're pretty quick. Why? Because that's, that's, I'm, a, I'm a helper of your joy. I'm here to be there for you. But we need to understand that absolute sufficiency of God's grace. And we're to take the absolute sufficiency of God's Word that makes all this real and bring it into our lives. Folks, we want to help one another. We're not going to help them by sitting over there crying with them, you know, as the saying goes, crying their spilt beer over there. It ain't going to happen. All you're doing is misery upon misery. You're going to have to come in and say, hey, look, you need to grow up. Let's, let's wake up here a little bit. Let's get moving. Come on. And you do it gently and with meekness and long-suffering and then the spirit of that. But you can't do that if you're not already there. doesn't mean you're perfect, as in you don't mess up and you don't need the help. Because I need help. <laughs> More ways than one. But the thing is, is you have to be, you see family members that are hurting that won't come here because they don't understand right division or whatever. You still need to be there for them because you know what they need to see? They need to see God in you, Christ in you. But you can't do that if you're over here floundering around and not knowing who you are in Christ. And we have, and, and by the way, the critical issue in all of this in order to help others is that we have to cultivate the proper attitude of the grace life. We have to have a heart for the Lord. We have to have a teachable spirit. We have to have a desire to serve others. And we have to depend completely and totally on who we are in Christ. His attitudes, His thinkings, His mindset. And when we develop that ability, come back to 1 Thessalonians 5. When we develop that ability to take God's Word and appropriately grow in it from milk to meat. How do you do that? It's by the, the use, the sincere use of the meat, the sincere use of the Word of God. 
and you begin to take it and you begin to work it into your life and you begin to develop the skills to use the Word of God with the tender heart of His grace, then you can help others. Then you can come along and say, you know what? Let me tell you about my story, where I've been. Let me tell you about the time I struggled to get out of the bed because I was in a bad case, in my own thinking, wallowing in my own self-pity. Let me tell you about the time when I walked off the job because I had had it up to here. Let me tell you about the time, and, and not to waller in your story, but to then be able to say 1 Thessalonians 5.18 to them, in everything, give thanks. But to say that, hey, you know where I got, you know how I got out of that position? You know how I got up out of bed? It was because my wife came and sat right next to me and was there. She didn't say anything, because if she did, I'd have yelled at her. She was just there. She pulled the curtain back on the window, opened the window up because it stunk. Not literally, just figuratively. But she was there. I got up, opened an email from a lady. Hey, I just wanted to say thank you. <sighs> really? For what? If you can just see what I just did for the last three days. But thank you for the ministry, for the work, for the word. Can't do any more but just say, thank you. Ooh. Ladies in the other part of the country. Another lady from across the pond right, says, hey, just wanted to say thank you. Love the website. Love the YouTube. Just thank you. By the way, check's in the mail, but it bounced back to me. You know, she didn't say that. But just thank you. You know what kind of help that is? They didn't do anything special. They didn't rain down, Rick, you know the verses. They were just there. Because both of those ladies I know very personally, and you know what? I know where they are, and they were where I needed them to be at that moment. You have to develop that. That doesn't just come overnight, by the way. And it comes from you're renewed in your mind. The outer man perished, but the inward man is renewed. Day by day. We need to do all this so that we can be where we need to be in order to help others. And that, folks, to say it simply, is that we need to be resting in the sufficiency of His Word and in the sufficiency of His grace. And to rest anywhere else is not to accomplish any help to anybody else. To go somewhere else or to do something else is only to make matters worse. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You'll never know the impact that you have on me, my life, and I on yours, I'll never know until we stand in glory at the judgment seat and it's there. But where the impact happens is is right here in the Word and in the life. And the key is that issue of thanksgiving. So next week we'll talk about thanksgiving. How are we going to help each other? Come up, we'll be there. The support system, if you will. Shorten all those ten points down. But we also going to help each other by being where we need to be. And you know where we need to be? We need to be right here in the Word of God, rightly divided. And we need to learn. If you don't know, you, folks, it's, it always amazes me. Well, I don't know as much as this guy or that guy. It doesn't matter what you do know and don't know. It's that what you operate in and what you do know. And if what you do know is little, then what, sh- what do you then know? I need to study out and get some more. So we get study and we get some more. And then when you know this, you get to... And then when somebody comes along and says, you know what, I've really been struggling with something. Can you help me? And you can say, yeah, I can because I understand God's love for me and my love for you is coming out of that. 
And I'm not going to re-preach the message, but it's, it, it, it's, it's exciting. One little thing, this last couple days, I have, we put on the website our, our history. We have a little book floating around here somewhere. It's got our history and a bunch of pictures and stuff. And the first 10 years and then picking up in 2010 to the present. So it's on the website. You can see it there. And I was reading down through it in the book, and it's got a lot of information, addresses and everything. And we took all that out to go out in the public, you know. And I, Nick and Susie are here, and I'll probably make them cry. But I remember the first time they came. I was done. We were down to me and Linda and the kids, and I'm like, you know, I'm just, this is not just, you know. And Nick, we meet Nick through the internet, and I'm like, you know, you guy's weird. Comes to the house, brings Louie, you know, we get to talk and we get to study. And first Sunday he was there, I had it set up, man, with pulpits up, boards up, I'm ready to teach. And he, it's just him and I. And I'm sitting there going, this guy's never coming back. He's never coming back. So for the next hour and a half, we just Q&A'd, just answered questions back and forth. Susie wouldn't come. I ain't going to the house. No way. See, I told you. She would know. Uh-uh. But eventually she did. So Nick tells me he's going out the door. We're going camping. We'll be back. I'll be back. They went camping. They didn't come back. I told Linda, I said, they're not coming back. I told you. They, you know, oh, so I, now, you have to understand, I've been out in the neighborhood in our neighborhood, we have 438, 468 homes. I knocked on every one of them. Wham! Then I realized it's the white shirt and the black tie. Like, oh, man. <laughs> okay? So then I went out in my polo shirt and no go. But the Marcosians did come back. A few other people, this and that. And... I remember the day when Nick told you, he goes, we got to get out of your living room, dude. <laughs> so we went around the corner, and, and history began. But had it not been for them coming through the Internet and how, we wouldn't be here today. Because I was done. I was done. I had been out. I had been working at it. Run up against that wall. I just, pfft, I was done. A couple winter visitors come in. Hey, we heard you got it. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, we'll see you maybe. If there's a car in the driveway that we're there. If not, we're not. We put dad on the radio. We did everything. And then in walks a newbie. <laughs> and it's like, okay, cool. He helped me. Didn't even know it till years later when I told him, and we cried in our, not beer, but in our sodas, okay? That's a song. It can happen just that way. It doesn't have to be a bad, you know, deep, dark depression. It can be just in a, you know what, I'm flying up the white flag, I'm done. And somebody come along and say, hey, thank you, and let's get out of the living room and let's get going. And we did. So you can hug him and tell him thank you, <laughs> and, and Susie. Because Susie did come, by the way. Now, I share that with you because I was thinking about it, but in everything, give thanks. It was that simple. It was that little bit of a moment in time that the help came from an unlikely new believer. New, brand spanking new. <laughs> I can remember, well, anyway, the questions. And I'm sitting there going, I hope I answered that one right. If he comes back, then I did, <laughs> you know. But see, the issue is, is the help. You will help others, and you might not even know you do until later they can do what? Say, hey, by the way, back there a few years ago, you really helped. By the way, now you can't get rid of me, okay? All right? Or him, <laughs> okay? But the, ish, that, the, but the thing is, I, I say that because I want you to think about when you're helping people, it is not about you and the grand dosy thing. It's just about a simple being there for each other. In everything, give thanks. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We do thank you for who we are in your Son. We thank you for the spiritual blessings, for, for the fact that you've given to them as a demonstration of your manifold wisdom and understanding and plan and purpose that you have for us in the household of God. And Lord, I just pray for everyone here that as we think about these things and as we move forward in the days of our lives and as we contemplate the details of our lives, that we would do so from a heart of thanksgiving, from a heart of understanding first what you've done for us so then, then we can then go and be who we need to be for others around us. So then at the end, and whatever we say in word or deed, we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise. Amen.